So thank you, everyone. Um, as mentioned, I am Mark Parsons. I'm the Secretary General of Research Data Alliance. And so I'm going to tell you about the Research Data Alliance. But before I wanted to get into that, I, in, with the purpose of this topic, is, of this talk, is to tell you what we need in addition to open data. Opening up the data by its, in and of itself is insufficient. You have to make the data actually usable. So I thought I would start with this, just a story of a particular data collection that I'm familiar with. I come from an organization called the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And one of our flagship products is a product on sea ice, frozen ocean water. Um, sea ice is a phenomenon in the, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. It grows and shrinks every year you know, with the seasons, but it never completely disappears. It reaches its minimum extent in, in September. Um, and this movie, if you look, you'll see on the left, so in September 2012, we shattered all records of minimum sea ice extent. So that's, that's 2012 on the left, and we're cycling through 30 years of, of sea ice extent on the right. That little magenta line that you can maybe see shows you the 30-year median extent. And you can see that 2012 is well below that. And also just to note that that 30-year median is not in a period of steady state. Those 30 years have been seeing steady declines. So it's, 2012 really stood out as, as a, as a record-smashing year. And it followed a record-smashing year of 2007, where we first really started noticing this, really started paying close attention to us. And the, my, our, my data center got all sorts of attention. Um, we were on the front page of the New York Times. Um, Al Gore, former vice president, Nobel laureate, came to visit the, the data center. It was a big deal. And so this was a data set that had been open since the 80s. And, but it had gone through this long evolutionary process. Um, I'll just cycle through that again. Whoops. All right, well, this is, a, well, I'll get to this in a second. Um, I thought I could just make that go again. Um, the long evolutionary process to lead to this pretty picture that's just showing you CI's extent. And there are several things I want to touch on. One is algorithms. So um, these data um, that I'm showing here come from passive microwave remote sensing um, sensors on satellites. So it's measuring the microwaves that naturally emit it from the planet. It's great for looking at the Arctic because you can see, if you will, in the dark, which in the Arctic's half dark half the year, and you can see through clouds. So it's a great way to get a pan-Arctic view. When the instrument was first designed, it was designed by the Department of Defense for operational weather forecasting. Nobody was thinking about sea ice. So but people started developing algorithms to, to where we could then actually uh, measure sea ice. Well, there were a series of competing algorithms. So which algorithm was best? We were always asked at the data center. And the, question, and the answer is, well, it depends. What's your application? And it actually became sort of a political thing for us to say which algorithm was better for which um, application. It was it's sort of a, the politics of science, if you will. It's, but the data center was able, over time, to act as sort of an honest broker. that could say, all right, here's where you use this algorithm, here's where you use this algorithm. Um, there's also the construction of time series. So this started in the 70s with a particular instrument. The instruments have evolved. There have been multiple satellite platforms. And stitching together those products into a continuous time series was a research effort in its own right um, and introduced additional uncertainties. And so that, combined with these algorithms, made this much more complex data set than you would think than it appears on the surface when you're just looking at this pretty picture. And the data center playing this role as broker, we actually ultimately went back and wanted to do a reprocessing of the whole time series and have a consistent benchmark data site. We found in the, that process that we could not actually fully replicate the data. There were human decisions made along the way that were not well documented, were not encoded in the, in the, um, in the actual algorithms. So we couldn't actually reproduce the data, which, you know, in the time of heavy scrutiny on climate data, that, that struck us as somewhat of a problem. So the point there is algorithms um, and time series and also gridding schemes and projections, a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. The other one I wanted to talk about is context. So just the concept of ice edge. Where is the edge of the ice? If you're a climatologist, you define it one way. If you're someone trying to run a ship through the Arctic, you define it another way. If you're a hunter that uses the, the ice as a platform to hunt seals or whales, you define it a different way, all from the same data. Um, so that context, again, made us 
present, have to present the data, explain the data, and relate the data in a different way to re reach those different audiences. Last project I was working on before I left the data center was actually developing ontologies uh, of sea ice to describe data in these different contexts. Um, the other thing I just want to emphasize is this increased attention made the public interested in this data. And so that led to, in addition to pretty, chart, pretty pictures like I just showed you, here's another example that really I think shows how 2012 is really anomalous. I don't know if you can see. No, you can't. There is a gray, a gray range on here. There's two standards of deviations. And this two standard deviations ends about here and 2012 is, is down here. So you can see in context how dramatic 2012 really was. So this is actually a dynamic chart that you can get on the website. You can play with it and so forth. This was a response to a public need, a press need, to be able to, again, understand this context. <laughs> to put, so this, this is the product. That, so you're thinking one data set. And again, we can't see our gray shading. The, day, the, gray, the data set that I presented in that video is actually these three things right here. So these different things, the brown squares are data sources, if you will, the raw brightness temperatures of the passive microwave. The green hexagons are the sort of main products, sea ice and in various, image, in various representations. The blue ovals are um, near real time products. The red octagons are um, interpretive products, uh, you know, things like climatologies or graphs, things like that. And the brown rounded uh, squares, which I don't even see right now. Oh, the, the yellow squares up there, those are um, uh, preliminary products that ultimately go away. So these, in essence, are all represent different representations of the same thing. Um, but we need to work them all together into this complexity and all these relationships between these products, the humans and their political issues and their scientific issues, the metadata that describe all of this is all necessary to present just one, one data set. So in essence, what we're trying to do, what the data center was trying to do over the 30 year history of this data collection, and I actually have a paper in press that describes all of this, um, is to increase the generative value of the data. And I really like this concept, generative value. This comes from John Wilbanks, who riffs on uh, John Zittrain, who was originally talking about the generative value of networks, particularly the internet. And it's, uh, he defines it as the capacity to produce unanticipated change through unfiltered contributions from broad and varied audiences. And this is actually somewhat antithetical, I think, to some of, uh, of our data practice. The idea is to make it freely open and let people have at it and see what happens. So going back to my sea ice example, the sea ice researchers for decades told the polar bear researchers, do not use these pasture microwave data. They're too coarse, the uncertainties are too great, they don't work in your application. I was at the American Geophysical Union conference um, about six months ago. I saw four or five posters presenting polar bear research that was using this data. The sea ice guys, are the experts that produce the data are not the people that you want to ask about reuse. They don't, they don't know, they can't conceive of how their data might be reused. They're, right to focus on the uncertainties and to explain those uncertainties, but ultimately those polar bear people um, needed to use whatever data were available. This is what was available. So this concept of generative value, is, it become, data become more generative by not just being open, but by being more adaptable, being able to be reused in different contexts, more easily mastered, so the polar bear researcher didn't have to be an expert in sea ice to be able to understand and use these data. Um, more accessible, so not just up there on the website, but usable in your tools um, and so forth. And more connected or influential, interactive with other data, if you will. And that's maybe the harder concept to get around. But the point is that we're talking about, when we're trying to think about the value of data, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about net present value, but net potential value. What, what value might we get out of this? And so to maximize that potential value, we need to do these things. And the way John Wilbanks presents it is on these four, um, these four dimensions that I mentioned, accessibility, adaptability, ease of mastery, and leverage. So you might think of this, that leverage is that interconnection, if you will. So you might think of this as a space that we want to fill, that we want to maximize or optimize all those different, um, different things. So that's one product. 
one parameter in one discipline. Um, and, that's and that's the complexity involved in making that data open and usable. We want to do that for all data across all disciplines. So to, open, to make open data work, here are a few things, not all, not all things by, by any means that we need. Trust is a central issue. I mentioned that issue of the algorithms and the competing algorithms. There was an issue with the, the scientists trusting the data center to be an honest broker. There's an issue, uh, I mentioned the issue of not being able to fully reprocess the data. Um, that's an issue of trust in the data itself. So there's an issue in trust of the repository, the science, the algorithms, etc. Context, I, I told you a lot about context. How do we present that context in a way that not only humans but machines can understand? How do we get those implicit assumptions out in a way that's relevant? Curation, which in my mind is adding value. All of this through all is what we're doing is we're often focusing on the interfaces, the connections, the relationships, mediation, bridges, if you will, and I'll come back to this metaphor of bridges, but it's bridges between people, bridges between machines, machines and people, machines and institutions, etc. cetera. Um, and so that's the last one is people. The people are central to what we're doing on all of this. And that implies that there's a training need. Data science is a new discipline that people need to be trained in. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is one data set. One discipline, enter the Research Data Alliance. Our vision is researchers, innovators, openly sharing data across technologies, disciplines, and cultures, I would pr prefer, to address the grand challenges of society. So, you know, tech across technologies is one thing, across disciplines, disciplinary cultures, co and scales, temporal scales, uh, spatial scales, um, scales of perception. Um, and so that's our vision, is that people can actually use all these different data from in seamlessly together. Our mission, what we want to do in the short term to actually make this happen, is build these social and technical bridges that enable open sharing of data. And this is not just arbitrary. This social and technical bridges concept is actually rooted in theory. There is a, a, a group of, a body of work called infrastructure studies that looks at how infrastructure is created over time. And that's ultimately what we're trying to produce here, is a, as a data infrastructure. And so that if you read one thing on infrastructure studies, I would really recommend this report. Um, it's a pretty concise report, and it really gets to the heart of things. And it did a nice review of historical infrastructures, everything from the railroads to the banking systems to the internet. And it notes that they all go through this phase development. They're not designed from a top-down perspective. Instead, they, they sort of come through an evolutionary phased process, starting with an initial technical system building phase where you're developing specific technologies. And then there's a sort of tech transfer phase where it, the tech transfer is across different domains or maybe even competing systems start to develop. And the classic example you can think of is ACDC in developing elect the electrical grid, is com those, those competing systems. And we certainly see that in our data world in terms of the different tools, the different metadata standards, et cetera. Um, but then finally there's this consolidation phase where things start to come together into internetworks. And they are marked by gateways or what you might call bridges. Um, and I would argue that maybe we're in that phase now. We're beginning into that phase now where we're starting to interconnect these different pieces. And that's where the Research Data Alliance is really focusing. And since we're trying to do this across all disciplines, we need to do this as a broad community. We can't just do this within our own little siloed communities. We need to do this across all communities. So really when we're thinking about infrastructure, we spend so much time asking ourselves what is infrastructure and we tend to think about the pipes and wires. But it's not really a question of what is infrastructure, but when is infrastructure? When do we get to that phase that is marked by these gateways and bridges? And I'm arguing that it's now and we need to focus on those bridges. But also it's not just a question of when is infrastructure, but who is infrastructure? Because as this report notes, Often we think of it, whether, whether it's a social problem or a technical problem or a social solution or a technical solution. And often, and more typically, um, it's a combination. And even when it is a technical solution, it's coupled with a social choice. It's all well and good for us to agree to use, for us to have a standard, but we have to agree to adopt it. And we have to agree to adopt it in the same fashion. So it's that coupling of the social and technical that really is important. So for my purposes, the way I think of infrastructure is as a body of relationships, um, interactions, connections, as I mentioned before, between people, technologies, and institutions. 
So this is what RDA wants to do, is wants to foster those relationships, build those bridges. We have kind of a mantra of create, adopt, and use. So we have short-term focused efforts at the end of which there is some um, adopted code, a particular specification or standard in place and working, um, something that enables data sharing. It gets us across one little barrier towards making data sharing work. That efforts that have broad applicability, but we're not so naive to think that we're going to have one solution that works across everything. So, um, but, and then things that can start today. So that's basically all we require of our working groups and interest groups, is come up with an idea that helps build these little bridges. And we provide some unity on that in saying, but we want you all to agree to a common set of principles. And those principles are openness, and that's not just open data, but open in how we do our work, open in our processes, et cetera. Um, Consensus-based decision-making. Um, a balanced approach, try not trying to favor one particular technology or approach over another, trying to consider a balanced approach. Similarly, trying to harmonize approaches where possible, trying to uh, reduce that level of competition. And then we're community driven and, and nonprofit. Maybe another way of looking, Fran Berman has another way of sort of presenting what some of these outputs are that we're trying to produce, that our working groups are trying to produce. So they're adopted policy. It's all well and good to have a policy, you actually have to adopt it and implement it. Systems interoperability, common types, standards, metadata, um, sustainable methods, sustainable economics, um, adopted practice, not just policy, and then as I mentioned with that people component, training and educating the workforce, the data workforce. So here are, we have 16 working groups right now. I'm not gonna go through them in detail. Um, I don't have time, obviously. The ones in green have actually completed they have delivered their outputs. I'll talk about them in a second, which I think is pretty impressive. We're an international organization that's only two years old, and we actually have real deliverables. Not very many international organizations can say that. And they're, and they're not just white papers. Um, and the yellow ones will be delivering soon. In addition to these working groups, which live for only 18 months and have and produce and adopt some, some little piece of the data infrastructure, we have many interest groups. And interest groups have a broader remit um, and when RDA was originally conceived, we didn't even think about interest groups, but it became clear that to get to that sort of 18 month really focused work that you can get done, you need to have a bit of discussion getting to, re to refine that. So that's one purpose of interest groups. It also brings the community, it's community together from different disciplines, from different, um, from different perspectives, and that in itself has proven to be very, very beneficial. Just the community aspect in and of itself um, has proved to be one of the, um, the best, uh, most uh, impactful outcomes, I think, of RDA so far. So I mentioned I can't go through all the working groups and interest groups right now, but um, going back to this sort of perspective from Fran Berman, she talks about we're, we're trying to build this data engine and make the data engine work better. So there's the technical parts of the data engine, if you will. And so an example there is we have a, um, a group that's developed a data type registry. And this would be a federation of registries. You might think about this as mind types for data. Um, so it's a way for a machine to understand that this is a particular data type. It knows what the columns and rows are, if it will. It knows what the units are and can operate it with more, more quickly. Um, more specifically domain focused, there is a wheat data interoperability group that is looking specifically around a semantic approach to making wheat data. And that means you know, things like the moisture and protein content of the wheat, but also um, maybe climatological information associated with it um, so that we can share wheat information around the world, which if you think about it is really critical because it's, it's a central thing to feeding the six billion people on the planet. Rules of the road, furthering with our little car metaphor. So a common agreement on data citation. So this is something that emerged out of RDA and the broader community almost very quickly in terms of high level principles. And now there's some various, getting into much more specific details about how to um, cite very dynamic changing data. Common practice or actually for data repositories, a, a harmonized scheme for um, endorsing data repositories. Um, principles of legal interoperability. Um, we, <clears throat> we heard from our introduction the challenges of IP. Um, what is, what is, how do we address that in a data context? That's still very wide open and it's very um, national dependent. Um, so this group is trying to develop some shared principles that will work across those different domains. And then of course to make the car work you need to have better drivers. So we have a summer school program that's working in collaboration with CoData, reaching out to the third world. 
And um, data management plans are becoming de rigueur, if you will. They're, um, the National Science Foundation in the U.S. has required data management plans for all their proposals for a few years now. It's becoming more common in a lot of other countries. But the point here is that a plan is not enough. A plan, it needs to be ongoing active planning. I like to quote um, Dwight Eisenhower, plans are worthless, but planning is essential. Um, so that's, I think, an interesting way of looking at it. Another way of seeing how these all fit together comes from uh, Peter Wittenberg and others and he calls it the data fabric. And this is actually sort of a double entendre. Peter is German, and Fabrik means factory in German. So it's, it's sort of, again, this sort of production concept, but it's also, I think, meant to evoke you know, a fabric, a network, an interconnection. Um, and so this is a really simplistic view of how data might be produced. But it's worth walking through. Um, you have some raw data. It comes in, it is registered. This is really key. This is a central thing. But by registered, meaning it gets a persistent identifier and a little bit of metadata. OK, it's now in this nice permanent store. You know where it is. It's described. You can reference it persistently. Someone using it typically, not always, but often it's copied. They do something with it. They put it in their own little collection. They run it through some sort of process to do whatever they want which leads to some other collection, which ultimately needs to be registered again back into the permanent store. And it's this that is then referenced by, by citations and so forth. So these guys here in the middle are our first five working groups. And you can start to see, and so they're really working sort of some of this underlying machinery. And so you can start to see where they fit in. So just persistent identifiers, a central piece of a data infrastructure has really emerged, I think, as a common theme, is that we need to unambiguously point to what we're talking about. And that means not just articles and data, but also people, institutions, instruments, etc. So we have persistent identifier types, if you will, that describe what those persistent identifiers are identifying. I mentioned the data type registry so that you can improve your processes. Practical policy. Here on the right, um, a better word than policy might be machine actionable rules. Are there consistent rules that we can use for basic things like fixity checking or copying that we can be sure are used consistently from repository to processing system and so forth? It's a trust issue, okay. I'm not gonna talk about metadata, metadata is everywhere. Um, and then this which actually has helped lead to this very simple diagram and this concept of registration, is that we just basically need to have a foundational terminology to be clear on what we're talking about. So all it is is, is about a dozen terms, things like digital object, that we all at least have a common agreement on some basics that we're working on. So these are pretty esoteric little things, but you can see that there's those little bridges that start to come together to make um, a larger data infrastructure work together. Um, as we go through this, I'm not going to go through all of it, but we have a bunch of other groups, interest and working groups that fit in here. For example, data management plans, um, domain repositories is one, certification of repositories. Um, I don't even remember what that stands for. Um, reproducibility, provenance. Um, brokering across different systems, et cetera. So th this is just another view. I think it's not the only view, and I don't even think it's fully correct, but it's one view of, of how we can start to get these little bridges to fit together into a larger system. So here are our initial products. Um, yeah, I guess I'll go through them quickly. I mentioned the foundational terminology as, as, as basic terminology so that we know what we're talking about includes a query tool. This will grow over time. Um, I mentioned the data type registry. I think this is really exciting. It's also really hard. Um, but it's also been already t taken up by the Materials Genome Initiative in the US, which has a sort of a similar counterpart that's starting up here in Europe. Europe. An, org an international group called the Deep Carbon Observatory has started using this. So it's actually being adopted. So it's going to be interesting to see if this can really take off. A persistent identifier type registry, I mentioned that, so that we know what we're actually pointing to, or the machines actually know what we're pointing to. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the machine actionable rules. Coming soon, some of the things that will be out soon are, is a metadata standards directory. That's in collaboration with the Dig Digital Curation Center, who will be um, speaking soon, Kevin Ashley. Um, and it's so that you know what metadata standard to use for what data. You know, the wonderful thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. Um, this is a, help, a way to help you choose.
Um, I mentioned the dynamic data citation methodology. This is something I'm really personally interested in. Um, but it's a proven, demonstrable, usable way that we can cite precise subsets of changing data. So I can cite that particular subset of that um, CI data from a particular time in a particular place with a particular algorithm and in a way that is um, immediately referenceable. Um, I mentioned the wheat data um, things. Um, and then also, I think this is another interesting one, and I'm still sort of getting my head around it, is a way to enable discovery across different registries. So many things that we're working on is, ends up with being registries, whether we're registering persistent identifiers or metadata or data sets or what have you. How do we start having intercommunication across these different registries? And then finally, a unified repository certification scheme that combined the data seal of approval and the world data systems approach. So this is a good example of that harmonization bridge. Um, so these are kind of small little things, but we're two years old and we have eight small little things that are actually being implemented by organizations that we hope we're going to build into a, a, a working infrastructure. And I think it's sort of, you know, it, we're working in a positive direction. And, and, and it would seem that the community agrees. Um, we are growing. Um, this is several months old now. This is, I think, from March, um, just before our last plenary meeting. Um, so we may be pushing 3,000 now. Um, if you haven't joined, please do so. Um, and, but you'll see that we, and we are a global organization. We come from 95 different countries. Um, but we're heavily biased to Europe and North America. And that's something that we want to work on in the coming year, months. Um, is trying to reach out more to um, the developing world and Asia and other parts of the world. Um, it's not shown here, but we're also largely um, academics. We're about 60% academics. Maybe 15% government, 15% um, industry, 10% other. That's roughly correct. Um, and we recognize that if we want these deliverables to actually have uptake and actually make a difference, they need to be adopted. And so they need to be adopted not just by academics in their labs, um, but they need to be adopted by organizations, private organizations as well as um, public organizations. So as in addition to in individual membership, we have organizational membership. And this is an opportunity for an organization. And, and unlike individuals, organizations actually pay, pay dues. They're fairly small dues. Um, but it's, it's a way for the organizations to have sort of a higher level voice as an organization in, the, in RDA to guide how things can be implemented. As I mentioned, it's organizations that implement, it's not individuals. So it's an opportunity for organizations to sort of be on the cutting edge in terms of defining not only what is produced, but what is relevant to, to, to their work and to, for them to see and influence development in, in this space. So these are our current organizational members and affiliates. You'll see that there's not a lot of private sector um, groups there, um, if any. Um, and so this is another challenge that we have going forward, is trying to engage industry more. I had a great conversation with some people from SDFC and CERN last night, um, and ICW here, um, on, how, on how, how to address that. Um, and I'll, that's, that's, I'll get to that in a minute. That's going to be a theme going forward. So going forward, our next steps for RDA, um, more infrastructure. Um, and this is in terms of a pipeline of deliverables. We want to keep producing these little bridges, both social and technical, and socio-technical. Um, a more effective community, um, increasing the coordination, communication across our community. This is a central challenge for me and the Secretariat is to try and to, if, we did not anticipate going from zero to 3,000 people in two years. Um, and so in facilitating that communication across, especially when we have 50 some interest groups and trying to get some sort of cohesion there. Um, and then outreach engagement. As I mentioned, we want to engage more with uh, the developing world and, um, well, the world beyond the North Atlantic, I should say. Um, but we also want more strategic partnerships with industry, with governments, um, and so we're looking really to have some more targeted outreach um, in events in that, re in that regard. Finally, um, our plenaries. We meet every six months. We bring the community together. Our next one will be in Paris uh, in September. I encourage you to attend. 
Um, and it, they're really fun. They're a different type of meeting than um, your typical research conference. Sure, we have our keynote speakers and so forth, but the vast majority of the time is devoted to the working groups and the interest groups actually getting together and working together, or in some cases trying to work across different, different working groups. And this next uh, plenary, we actually have a theme on climate, although we don't focus solely on climate by any means, and pardon my biases, but you know, uh, Human Brain Initiative, for example, is a huge component. But um, since it's in Paris, the French had a particular interest because the next International Climate Conference will be in Paris in December, so this is sort of feeding up to that. And as a way to engage industry, we've issued a, um, a data challenge. So um, it, the plenary is being hosted by Cap Digital, a uh, te French tech consortium of about 300 tech firms. And so they've issued this data challenge, first for data, data sets, that's, that's out there now, give us your climate related data sets, and then second to industry to say, all right, what can you do with these data sets? And industry should have an interest in climate change, be it, the, be it insurance companies, be it water companies, be it companies that are dealing with disaster response, um, et cetera. And so the idea here is that the winner, if you will, of the data challenge is the one that makes best use of RDA outputs. And that, per, and that organization gets to present at the um, IPCC conference in uh, Paris in December. So I encourage you to get involved. Join an interest group, join a working group, sign up to be a member of RDA, it's free. If you're part of an organization, uh, become an organizational member. Um, and the, really the best way to learn about RDA is to attend our plenaries. So I, I encourage you to come to Paris and then the next one will be in Tokyo after that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, there is a, an opportunity to uh, have immediate questions, comments. <clears throat> I, I'm from the commercial side. What is the deadline for submitting the proposals for usage of the data? The Paris so, so the data deadline, the call for data just ended. Um, but if you have data, we could talk. Um, but the the actual imp challenge part, the implementing something yes. with the data, that's that's just opened up. I think the deadline is end of July sometime. Um, it's right on the front page of our homepage. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, so I've worked with scientists in different domains and. Uh, what I've seen is when that they publish data, they have repositories, but only for that domain. Um, are you like fostering uh, interdisciplinary collaboration among these repositories? Uh, how to? Uh, well, uh, I'll repeat my question. So, are you fostering interdisciplinary collaboration among scientists uh, in different disciplines? That's yeah. That's central to what we're trying to do. I mean, that's that's you know our vision is um, people working across um, domains. Um, that said, um, domain repositories have a central role. So there is a domain repositories interest group, for example, that is trying to define what is common and what is um, and what is shared. I mean, what is shared and what is unique, and where they can work together. Um, I think engagement with the scientists themselves is a particularly challenging aspect. RDA tends to be those sort of in-between people. There's a few computer scientists and a few domain scientists, but most of the people are the people that are dealing with informatics, so everything that's in between, so applied computer science to maybe librarianship, if you will. Um, so, but we need to rely on those in-between people then to engage with the different disciplines. And that's actually, we have a strategic planning exercise going on right now. There's actually a survey out. I encourage you to respond to this survey on initiatives that we should be focusing on for our strategy. And one of them is we want to start identifying sort of domain liaisons or ambassadors, if you will. So we can start to hear those um, initiatives from you know, neuroinformatics and how that might relate to geoinformatics. You know, completely different things are there common issues that we can share. So yeah, it, yes, but it's hard. <laughs> yes, hello. Thanks for this interesting presentation. You mentioned that uh, persistent identifiers for data are key in your opinion. Could you elaborate a little bit how you see this? Do you think DOIs for data sets are the answer, or what is your thinking on this? Um, 
so I'm not, I'm not picking a particular persistent identifier. I, w I don't want to get into the religious wars of which persistent identifier you use for a particular case. Yes, DOIs seem to be having their day, and those are, and then I think in terms of, of a whole data set citation, um, it's what the journals understand best, so yes, please use DOIs. Um, but really my point is if you want to have that routine production of data sets and you want to be able to trace back the provenance of how that occurred you need to be you need to have to you sorry you need to unambiguously be able to refer to the exact data used and be able to point exactly where it is and that's what persistent identifiers do but you don't only need to do that for the data you need to say it also came from this particular instrument and we use this particular algorithm and so this unambiguous reference is, I think, central to any sort of functioning data e um, ecosystem, if you will. So that, that's, that's really my point. And I think we've seen that in RDA. It's come up not just in the persistent identifiers group, but almost probably every working group and most interest groups have bumped into this issue of, oh, well, we need to put a persistent identifier on that. And which one? I, it, it depends on your context. DOIs are great for some things, not all things. Thank you. Uh, do you consider preparing guidelines for national open research data policy? Yes and no. Um, for example, the Legal Interoperability Interest Group is preparing these principles that I think could be viewed as at least some initial guidelines. Um, it's in, RDA really doesn't want to do everything, and so I, we hear a lot, I think, from uh, uh, government that they need support on how do we implement open data policy. And we can give you some ideas, but that's ultimately more of a government issue. We're more interested in implementing the things that make it work. So we're, we're not in the area of making sort of policy recommendations per se, but I think Guidelines are something that we certainly would be producing, but they're going to be more down a level. You know, how do you actually implement a particular technology or a particular practice within a data center, <coughs> say, or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reference implementations as, as well. Maybe I can add to that. Sorry, my name is Mark Thorley. <laughs> oh, sorry. He's chasing you with the mic. So sorry to steal you. Oh, um, you so, so Mark, Mark talks about our day. My name is Mark Thorley. I'm a member of the Executive Committee of CoData, which, which is, is the ICSU favorite. Committee yeah. on Data for Science and Technology. And one of the things we're doing is I'm chair of their Data Policy Committee. So what we're doing is trying to develop data policy guidance at a governmental level to assist national science ministries, etc., and how they can develop their working in the open data space. So CoData and RDA work very closely together. So RDA is very much for bottom-up movement from very much for data science community. CoData is the top-down approach through the national academies and um, uh, national institutional level. And we're trying to work together on how we can actually develop the whole area of data policy at, you know, at an operational level and at a national uh, governmental level as well. So I hope that answers the question. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Together in the middle. So anyway, sorry, yeah, sorry, no, sorry, no, sorry, no, no, that's sorry, that's that's great, Mark. Um, because that's we have been collaborating closely with Codata on that. And the way one way I describe it is Codata is more strategic, RDA is more tactical. Okay, and yeah, I have a question. Uh, what would you recommend? Um, thank you. What would you recommend as a policy uh, in research? Uh, <laughs> whether the, this extra data effort to make it more available should be a part of each and every research project as a separate process in a research organization. Okay, so this is my personal opinion. This is not speaking on behalf of RDA. Um, I don't think it is reasonable to expect researchers to become data scientists. I do think researchers need training in data science. I do not think you should get out of graduate school without taking a data class. You have to take a methods class, you should have to take a data class. That said, there is a critical role for data professionals, and that needs to be recognized as a professional role in its own right. So I think it's both. We can't, I mean, we always need that subject, 
level knowledge from the researcher, and we can't escape that. Um, but we need to da the data professionals to develop the systems and the tools to make that really easy to access that, that subject level knowledge. Well, I don't see any further questions. Mark, thank you very much thank you. for playing your double role in this. <laughs>